So with that background of iris recognition as a very important biometric modality, we want to move on to talk about presentation attack detection. The presentation attack detection problem is to tell if an image presented to a biometric system is either bona fide or attack. A bona fide image is one that's presented with the intention to use the system honestly. An attack image is an image that's presented or an artifact presented to acquire an image that is intended or at least has very high potential to cause the biometric system to make an error. The types of uh, attacks that might be presented or the motivation for different types of attacks that might be presented, um, uh, there are several listed here. If we think of the WorldCoin uh, example, if, if I was to enroll in WorldCoin once and get my free small starter unit of WorldCoin cryptocurrency uh, and, and then want to enroll again by creating a virtual identity and maybe creating a hundred different virtual identities or a thousand different virtual identities and transferring the uh, units of cryptocurrency from all the extra identities that are basically me, all to me, and then cashing them out, I could be defrauding the system and making money from, from them in that way. So that's the motivation for creating a virtual identity, typically to get multiple units of some sort of uh, financial benefit. Um, the motivation to evade being identified on a watch list is one that was encountered early in the history of iris recognition. The uh, United Arab Emirates, if a guest worker is deported, um, their iris images are taken, they're putting on a, put on a watch list, the person is put on a watch list with their iris uh, identifiers, and everyone coming back into the system is compared against the cumulative watch list of everyone deported from the country. And if you match a deported record, you are not allowed back in. If I wanted to get back in, I would want to create an error where my iris images acquired today did not match my iris images on the watch list so that I wasn't identified as undesirable and I could enter the country. Uh, impersonating a selected identity is the kind of thing you see illustrated in movies often. Uh, there's a particular person who has access to a biometrically controlled system and I essentially want to be that person for purposes of uh, entering the system or accessing the resource that their biometric would allow them to access. Um, a more hypothetical thing, I might want to create a virtual identity that can be shared among multiple people so that the we could pass the ability to do something between individuals rather than have it belong only to one individual. And I put a dot, dot, dot here because the possible uh, motivations for uh, exploiting a biometric system will will evolve as the biometric systems evolve and as the creativity of the bad guys wanting to attack it uh, evolve. Now, here is a very simple example of iris presentation attack. One of these images is of a live, uh, normal, bona fide iris. And the other of these images could be regarded as an attack image. One of them is wearing a textured contact lens. And why is a textured contact lens an attack? Uh, a textured contact lens is one that is used to change the apparent color of your eye to other people uh, when they see you, but the, the uh, color pigment in the contact lens has a texture to it as well. And the texture in the contact lens then overwrites or, or is in front of and occludes the uh, natural texture of your iris. And so in this image here, you can perhaps tell from the edge out here in the sclera that there's a contact lens. And then you can tell from the um, regularity of the texture here in most of the iris region, which is different than the more random texture of a um, iris by itself, that the texture of the contact lens, the, the pigmenting in the contact lens that would give the iris an apparent color and texture, is, is blocking the 
natural texture. And so if I were expelled from the United Arab, Arab Emirates not wearing a textured contact lens and came back to cross the border wearing a textured contact lens, if you didn't detect that I was wearing a textured contact lens, I could pass through because I would not match my enrollment on the watch list. Uh, liveness detection is a, another phrase for presentation attack detection. The two phrases mean about the same thing. Liveness detection emphasizing uh, knowing that the image is bona fide. Presentation attack detection emphasizing detecting a, an attack image. There has been a sequence of uh, competitions in the research community for iris liveness detection. You can tell that they started small and the most recent one is quite large in terms of number of people, number of groups, number of countries and variety of research emphases um, in, that, have, that have participated in the competition to come up with the best iris liveness detection or presentation attack detection algorithm. So the point of this uh, stop along our way in the, in the talk is that presentation attack detection is an active research topic in biometrics and security. I've talked about it here in terms of iris, but it applies not only to iris, it applies to any biometric modality that you might use. Our next topic is open set presentation attack detection. I'm gonna start off with open set facial identification, which is the more um, commonly understood use of the term open set in biometrics so that I can distinguish this use of open set from open set presentation attack detection. And I'm gonna pull an example of open set facial identification from the uh, January 6, 2021 riot at the US Capitol. And here's an example of a picture of someone from the FBI website um, that is, that more information is one about, wanted about uh, in connection with the uh, January 6 insurrection. This is a person whose identity, at least initially, was unknown to the FBI, and we can think of this as the probe image. And the, an example way where that the FBI might use to try to find out who this person is, is search lists of uh, face images where the identity of the person is known. A possible example would be state driver's licenses. Uh, the state of Indiana in the United States has roughly four and a half million issued driver's licenses. The um, name, address, and other information about each of those people is known. And so the probe image could be matched against each of those four and a half million images to find out if there's likely uh, a likely suspect um, with an Indiana driver's license who is the person whose picture was recorded at the uh, insurrection in the Capitol. And the way um, that, that this can be done uh, with high accuracy, uh, or the, the reason why this can this matching could be uh, expected to yield high accuracy is described in a National Institute of Standards uh, and Technology report, uh, where they present convincing evidence that if the person's in the probe image, if the person in the probe image does in fact have uh, an image in the set of enrolled images that are matched against, in this case, up to 12 million matching and a, a particular example algorithm and the rank one match, that is the one of the 12 million images selected as the best match to the probe was in fact the correct person over 99 and a half percent of the time in these experiments. So very high confidence that if the person has an image in the enrolled set of images, the top ranked match will in fact be that person. There's still some chance that it will not. And so additional investigation would have to be done to verify that the person in the probe image, the unknown person in the probe image does in fact correspond to the highest ranked person. But that is a closed set sort of analysis for identification. We assume that the person is in the gallery open set phrase would be to say, well, what happens 
when the person is not in the gallery. And it takes just a moment of thought to realize that if the person in the probe image does not have an image in the gallery, then your best match from that gallery is a false match 100% of the time. So the uh, contrast between the 99.5% plus likelihood of getting the correct match if the person is in the gallery has to be tempered by the guarantee 100% of the time that the best match will be a false match if the person is not in the gallery. The failure to appreciate the nature of open set facial identification is a factor that has led to incorrect identification of uh, persons and some high profile uh, incidents in the news, some false arrests of persons where um, confidence in, in face recognition was misplaced and uh, work beyond facial recognition to verify that the person in the probe corresponded to the person in the gallery was simply not carried out or not carried out in a competent manner. Now, when we're talking about presentation attack detection, the situation is a little different. We're not talking about whether or not a person has an image in a gallery of images. We're talking about whether or not a particular type of attack is present in the training data and the test data used to construct the presentation attack detection algorithm. So for iris, rec for iris recognition and the problem of presentation attack detection and iris recognition, we know that we're trying to distinguish whether the image is a bona fide image or an attack image. But attack images are not a homogeneous monolithic type of image, there's many different types of attacks. So you've already seen the example of a textured contact lens being a type of attack image on an iris recognition system. A totally synthetic image, that is one that's created by graphic techniques and does not correspond to a real person, could be submitted to a biometric system. And that would be a, a rather different type of attack image. Um, an existing image could be printed out on paper and held up to the sensor for the sensor to take a picture of the printed image on paper, that would be another kind of attack different than the others. Um, certain diseases of the eye will uh, present conditions of texture and shape of the iris that um, are not a match to the assumptions made in the image analysis algorithms and therefore cause a failure in the segmentation and a creation of an iris code that's essentially at random for this iris so, so that certain disease conditions would allow a person to present an image again and again and again, and none of those images would match. And so they could enroll multiple times. So that's a, another type of attack. Um, prosthetic eyes, that is false eyes that are put in, physically eyes that are put in, physically prosthetic eyes that are put in could have a particular texture uh, on them. And it could be the same texture for shared by several people or, or uh, a, a targeted texture to, to impersonate a particular iris. And so prosthetic eyes would be another type of attack, um, combining paper printouts of textured contact lenses would, would result in another type of attack. And images of eyes of a person who is no longer alive, post-mortem iris images would be still a different type of attack. And so the question of open set presentation attack detection is, can you tell uh, the difference between bona fide and attack if the types of attack you have seen when you create the presentation attack detection algorithm are synthetic paper printout disease, prosthetic printout of contact and postmortem. But what you see as an attack is textured contact. That is, in the test portion of the evaluation, you see a type of attack that was not seen in training. So closed set means that all attack types have in the test data are in fact represented in the training data. Open set means that an attack type seen in the test data is not present in any form in the training data. Open set is clearly more rigorous and is more realistic for what will happen in practice than open set. So an 
I'm sorry, open set is more rigorous and realistic than closed set. Uh, open set is bringing to mind the context of you're operating a biometric system, you have a presentation attack detection algorithm, and you're interested in knowing what will happen when the bad guys first present a type of attack that you've never seen before. So the, for the rest of uh, this segment of the tutorial, I'm going to talk about a particular open set evaluation protocol for presentation attack detection. We are going to do leave one attack type out evaluation. That is, we're gonna have a particular attack type in the test data that's not going to be present in any form in the training and validation data. We are going to construct our data sets that we use from a very large, uh, in the context of, of iris recognition, set of images available to the research community. We have accumulated about 460,000 images that are made available by different research groups to the iris recognition community. Most of these images are bona fide uh, images, that is, they do not represent attacks. Uh, for the different attack types that, that we've talked about, there are anywhere from 277 to 27,000 images per each of the seven different attack types. And we're going to have both a small training version and a large training version uh, of our experiments. And in the small training version, we are going to have just 765 images, those augmented by eight differently smoothed versions of each of those 765 images. So a total image count of nine times 765, but uh, eight of those nine are just smoothed versions of, of a starting image. The uh, neural network type is that we're using in these experiments is a version of DenseNet specialized for uh, iris presentation attack detection. And we're gonna use pretty standard parameter settings, all of which are detailed in a paper that I will reference at the end of the talk. So as an example of the uh, type of result that we get. This is the result when printout images are the left out attack type. So the training and validation would not have any printout images in it, neither printout images of, of regular eyes or printout images of contact lens. Those would both be taken out of the training and validation, although uh, this accuracy is just for the printout images, not the printed contact lens images. And you can see that for our small training set, we get above random, but we really get only about 0.6 AUC. So it's not a very powerful algorithm trained on a small amount of data to be able to detect uh, printout images as an attack type. When we use all of the relevant data out of the 460,000 images for construction of the algorithm, you see that we get a much better algorithm than we use a small amount of data with an AUC of about 0.93. If we look across the other of the seven different attack types that we've uh, explored here, you can see a variety of different behaviors uh, for post-mortem images as the left one out attack type or prosthetic images as the left one out attack type. We get a pretty high area under the curve with large training data, but a fairly small, again, in the area in the range of 0.6 uh, area under the curve for a small amount of training data. For some of the um, more fundamentally difficult attack types like synthetic images, uh, the large data does not give us the same uh, accuracy as postmortem or prosthetic for the left out attack types. And the small amount of training data gives us a distinctly bad area under the curve. Remember, this is left one out attack type, so it's, it's quite possible for the results to be below 0.5 for area under the curve. Uh, for diseased eyes, again, uh, less good performance for contact lenses, less good performance on the large training data, and for a combination of textured contacts in paper printouts, uh, even smaller area under the curve for the large training data. So the, the point of this introduction to the idea of open set 
presentation attack detection is to say that open set analysis of the results of presentation attack detection is the current state of the art, the current frontier in evaluating presentation attack detection algorithms in biometrics. Okay, next we want to make a very brief stop uh, to talk about the topic of human ability at iris presentation attack detection. We performed an experiment where uh, 150 different uh, viewers, novices, not experts at iris recognition and, bio and biometrics technology, um, viewed iris images, an average of five viewers per image an average of uh, 27 images looked at by each viewer. The task for a viewer looking at, at an iris image is to select whether or not it's a bona fide iris image or an attack image, or just to, to say that they're unsure and they can't perform the categorization. If they say that it's an attack image, then we also ask which of the seven types of attack image it is. But at some level, we're interested in primarily the accuracy of telling bona fide versus attack. And for images which the person felt they could classify, that is excluding the unsure images, we ask them to annotate regions of the image that support the decision that they made. In the end, we have 765 iris images that have at least one correct classification by a human viewer as either a bona fide image or an attack image. And for those 765 images, we have annotations for each person who classified those images correctly. To get an idea of what kind of accuracy there is, this is overall summary numbers across the images and observers. Uh, of all the bona fide image presentations, 56% of the time they were classified as bona fide. Of all of the textured contact lens image presentations, 65% of the time they were categorized by the human observer as an attack image of all of the paper printout image presentations, 94% of the time they were categorized by the human observer as being an attack image. And you can see the rest of the accuracies, 98%, 84%, 70%, 88%, 77%. <laughs> the point of this uh, brief stop to consider human ability for classifying iris images as presentation or attack is simply to say that humans are, novice humans, are able to classify iris images as either attack images or bona fide images, the accuracy varying slightly between the categories of images, but all of them well above uh, a 50-50 accuracy. So now we come to the main topic or the destination topic for my segment of this tutorial. And that is how to train a better CNN using information about the regions that humans find salient in the image. Okay, first, human derived salience maps. How do we create a consensus map of where in the region the salient, re where in the image the salient regions are for human decision making. Here's an example original image. This uh, particular image is an attack image. This is a prosthetic, an image of a prosthetic eye. Here are five different salience maps, each specified by a different observer who correctly classified this original image as an attack image, and one observer traced out uh, sort of the, the edge of the uh, iris to sclera there and there, and it looks like they traced around the uh, specular highlight, and just below that, those are the regions that they marked as being important to them for their classification of this image as an attack image. This is the uh, regions marked by a second observer who correctly classified the image, the regions marked by a third observer, fourth observer, and a fifth observer. So salient regions annotated by different human viewers who correctly 
categorized this original image. We can imagine overlaying these five annotations. And if all five annotations uh, included a particular region of the image, that region is the most certain to be salient or the consensus salient region in the image. And if none of the five marked an area, that is a consensus not salient region. And then if four, three, two, or one observers, uh, so one, uh, marked a region, then it gets a lower heat in the salience heat map. So the concept of a salience heat map or a salience map is just representing the relative degree of consensus among the human observers who correctly cate categorize the image for what regions in the image are salient for making that decision. Now, I want to introduce an idea that may seem non-intuitive at first and try to make the case that this is a reasonable thing to do. And even more than that, a good thing to do when it comes to training deep neural networks. Here's an original image. Here's the salience map for that image obtained from uh, different observers, annotations of what would be the salient region in this image for them to make the correct classification of the original image. And here, we have an image where we have selectively blurred regions of this image according to the degree of consensus about the region's salience. So where all of the observers who correctly classified the image um, agreed that the original, the region of the original image was salient, we have not blurred it. Where none of the observers indicated that the uh, region was of the image was salient, they've been heavily blurred. And then there's different degrees of blur between no blur and heavily blurred based on how, what the degree of consensus was among the observers who categorized the image correctly. So this blurred image is directly created from the original image by applying levels of blur indicated by the degree of consensus in the salience specifications from the human observers who classified the image correctly. And now we're going to ask a question. What if instead of training the CNN as has always been done on images like this or an image like this that's been uniformly blurred throughout or, or jittered throughout or, or uh, other types of noise added to it. What if we trained the deep neural network on images that were selectively blurred according to the degree of consensus among human observers about the salient regions of that image? So this image, which intuitively seems poorer quality than this image, becomes the type of image that we use to train the deep neural network. Because this might seem counterintuitive that we would use an apparently lower quality image in training the neural network as our primary source for training the neural network, think of it this way and, and maybe it will make more sense. The training images are selectively blurred the less salient regions get the stronger blur and the consensus salient regions get no blur. And the effect then is to increase the emphasis on the more salient regions. The most salient region uh, has all of the detail of the original image. The least salient region is strongly blurred and it's hard to find something there to use to learn to solve the visual task. So now we're going to compare training with this selectively blurred image, the set of selectively blurred images where the blurring is based on human judgment of what are the salient regions with the traditional method. The traditional method you've already seen, um, we train on the original images and the augment each original image with eight different uniformly blurred versions of that image, different levels of blur, and we leave one attack type out. 
The validation is the original images, the same attack types are as are in the training. So the training and validation are seeing the same attack types. The test data is original images again, no blurring in the test data, no blurring in the validation data. In the test data, we see the images for the attack type not seen in training, right? So not blurred images in validation and test not blurred images uh, or the original images plus eight consistently blurred versions in the traditional approach. In our new salience blurred approach, we drop the original images entirely. We use only the selectively blurred versions of the original image. There are eight of them corresponding to the eight different levels of blur used in the traditional approach. So what happens? when we compare the traditional method of training a deep neural network with the idea of training a deep neural network on salience blurred versions of the original images, not the original images at all, using comparing, making this comparison using the same eight blurred level, the same eight blur levels, the same initialization of the deep neural network, the same learning parameters of the deep neural network, the only difference being in the uh, training data itself given to the neural network. Okay, so here we have for uh, the number of epochs, the accuracy on the training data. And we can see that whether we are training on the original or the salience blurred version of the images, both training accuracies in either scenario quickly go to near perfect and they stay there. So that's not really surprising because that's kind of what deep neural networks do. They memorize the training data and then hopefully also generalize. So here we have the accuracy on the validation data. This is for the small amount of, validate, of training data used the traditional way. This is for the small size training data used the salience blurring way. And you see a huge gap here in what happens with the validation accuracy in the two approaches. The validation accuracy of the traditional approach is not random, it's above random, and it bounces around, but it doesn't really improve over time. The validation accuracy of the assailants blurred training set starts off fundamentally higher on, on uh, epoch one. It acquires greater competence and it, in, and it improves slightly over time uh, to give us a substantially better accuracy on the validation data than the traditional approach. So this big gap in the validation accuracy, this gain in the validation accuracy achieved by using training data, which has encoded human salience into the data, is showing that the two different approaches are creating fundamentally different models. We are learning something fundamentally more competent by using training data, which has human judgment about the salient regions of the image encoded into it. Now, this is the training and validation accuracy, and you see it the same across all the different left one out attack types, whether we're doing synthetic as the left one out attack type, disease, textured contact, postmortem, prosthetic, or a combination of contacts and printout. There's always a fundamentally different model learned and more competent model learned, judging by the validation accuracy when we use the salience blurred versions of the training data. The harder problem is the left one out attack type, the test data, the attack type that was not seen in the training and validation data. This is the same results that you've seen earlier in this segment of the tutorial for the small amount of training data training the traditional manner and the large amount of training data training the traditional manner. This new curve added here in, the, in between them represents what is achieved on the left one out attack type when we use the small amount of data, 
in fact, smaller because we're, we have only eight salience blurred versions of each original image, not the original images here. Here we have the original and eight consistently blurred versions. So actually a smaller, slightly smaller count of number of pieces of data available in training, but we get a 0.86 AUC rather than a 0.6 AUC, where 0.93 is what can be achieved using large amount of data. So we significantly close the gap between the initial small amount of training data and sort of the ultimate from the large amount of training data by using the salience blurred approach. If we look across all of the different attack types as the left one out attack type, we see multiple cases where we see this large gain by using the salience blurred version for post-mortem, for diseased, for synthetic, all of those see a significant size gain. Prosthetic seems a, sees a more modest gain in the left one out attack type. Contact lenses see a more modest gain. And the combination of printout of contact lens images sees, again, a more modest gain. But the, the gap between what can be achieved by small and large data is also uh, much smaller in these. So where um, competence can be achieved by a large amount of data, large amount of training data, using the human salience versions of a small amount of training data significantly closes that gap towards what can be achieved by a large amount of data. So from this uh, set of results, you should be convinced that using human saliency in the training data results in higher accuracy and greater generalization than not encoding train human saliency into the training data. The takeaway points that I want to offer from my section of this tutorial are that this is the first ever use of human salience in CNN training. You will not have seen this approach anywhere else in any of the deep neural network literature. Importantly, because the only thing we do here is to modify the training data in a very specific way, we haven't made any assumptions at all about the CNN backbone. Our approach as described here is usable with any CNN backbone. Also important, our approach here is usable with any task that you could get information from humans about the salient regions of the input data. I, I won't even say images because I don't think it's limited to images as the form of the input data. It might be uh, sound recordings, for example. Uh, now there are tasks that human beings are not competent at. Um, the detection of pulse rate from video of the face being an example where people can't do that at all, but algorithms can. Um, uh, this approach won't help you do better at training a deep CNN for that particular problem. But there's many problems where humans are or do have some level of competence at the task and whatever your favorite CNN backbone is, you might be able to find a way of improving your performance by encoding human salience into the training data. There are many future research directions. This is in fact the first uh, step in, in what we believe will become a much larger body of research. For those of you who are interested in um, iris recognition and iris presentation attack detection, you will note that there are a couple of other uh, things of specific importance to that community. We have a new state-of-the-art algorithm in open set iris pad that's documented in this work. And we have assembled a new large composite data set, composite in the sense that we've acquired data sets from many different research groups and sort of uh, put them all together, eliminated all of the images that are not ISO compliant images and eliminated all the duplicate images, that is a single image which happened to appear in multiple different data sets, which has happened because people have shared data in the research community uh, and produced one fairly large data set, which can be used in uh, studying iris presentation attack detection and even iris segmentation, iris recognition sorts of algorithms. Now, 
uh, this is the point where I, if it was live, I would be moving to take questions. I will point before we uh, move into questions. If you're interested in the details of the algorithm, that, which was featured as the main result in this segment of the tutorial, those are all in this paper, uh, which is readily available. If you're interested in iris presentation attack detection in general, I would recommend this paper, which gives a nice summary of the history uh, and the state of uh, presentation attack detection circa 2017, 2018. And if you're excited by this idea of using human knowledge to produce better deep neural networks, I encourage you to take a look at this paper, which is sort of the next step and goes beyond simply changing the training data to begin to modify the algorithm used on, on a particular backbone. Uh, for for creating the deep uh, CNN model. And in closing, I want to thank you for your uh, patience and your intention and in watching this video for my segment of the tutorial. And I hope to interact with you either in person or perhaps through email about the content of this tutorial. Thanks again and aloha.